Flag Scene Investigation, Episode 1, The Case of Estahoka and the Flag of the State of Muskogee. Flag research today has undergone significant change, thanks largely to the internet and the availability of resources that once were very difficult to access and often required expensive travel. A few important techniques need to be kept in mind when pursuing this research. The present case in point illustrates these techniques in action. Research methodology. When pursuing information on unknown flag designs, specific research techniques are important. Among these, searching the web. Today's internet is vast, but contains many false and misleading terms. It is important to look at these items and categorize them for their accuracy and the importance each item may have in your search. Treat everything with a grain of salt and pursue the references diligently. There are no references. If there are no references, treat the item as someone's possibly uninformed opinion, especially consider their motive for posting the item. Be especially aware of alternate history fantasy flags. Newspaper archives. Today, there are a number of archive sites that offer varying degrees of historic newspapers. These sites are a gold mine, although it is a real challenge to craft successful search criteria. One has to remember alternate and antiquated spellings and terms such as colors and standards that may refer to flags as well as to other non-related items. Be creative, think outside the box. Remember that these sites are constantly adding new content so future searches may yield additional results. Government archives. More and more government archives are being scanned and published on the web. Like the newspaper archives, thinking creatively regarding search terms is a must and possibly even more difficult, especially considering many of these are in languages other than English or your native language. Although limited translations may be available, searching is usually only possible in the original language. These are also adding additional items over time. Beware of vexy chauvinism. Possibly the biggest single fault we have as researchers is projecting our own historical and design thoughts onto historic flags. What we see may not be what they intended centuries ago. Many cultures, vexillology has been portrayed using Western and European design motifs that are simply wrong. Always question any design element or historic association that appears to be of non-native or non-period origin. Develop theories and motives, but be able to change as the evidence mounts. As you search, develop your theories as to what the answers could be, but be prepared to change those theories as you collect the evidence. Not everything is obvious. Keep studying those flags. Even after you've exhausted all avenues and you think you've pieced together the story, never close a case completely as there is always the possibility that new evidence will later become available that could change your thesis and understanding of the flag in question. So, while searching newspapers.com for general flag references, I found a newspaper article with news from Nassau, Bahamas, dated August 5th, 1791, which states, a new flag was displayed here on Wednesday, which would have been 3rd August, 1791, it was that of the Creek Nation, worn by a vessel in which General Bowles and the Indian chiefs embarked on their return to the American continent. The <coughs> article went on to say the Indians had won the right of free trade for vessels displaying their flag while they were in England. Another article also cited news from Nassau, New Providence, which is the Bahamas, dated August 31st, 1791, quoting the same General Bowles. By virtue of an act worthy of the British Parliament, I have this day hoisted the flag of the Creek Nation on board our new armed brig called the Union, which flag received all the honors by salutes, etc., that could possibly be given by the governor. Philadelphia's General Advertiser published an excerpt from Bartrand's Travels on August 31st, 1792, referencing the Indians of Cuscoilla in the Creek country, stating the chief who was called Cowkeeper resided in a grand house, and I quote, which stood on an eminence and was distinguished from the rest by a large flag being hoisted on a high staff at one corner. Still another news article dated uh, more than a decade later on June 2nd, 1802 at St. Mary's, Georgia, details information that the noted General Bowles had commissioned a privateer, formerly of New Providence, 
but now sails under Bowles' Muskogee flag. I was intrigued. Here was a reference to a Native American flag of a far earlier period than any I was familiar with, that of the Creek Nation, apparently also referred to as Muskogee. All of these news articles referred to one General Bowles as the instigator. The search began. Who was General Bowles? General Bowles was not hard to find. Born William Augustus Bowles in Maryland in 1763, uh, he served in a loyalist unit volunteering in 1777 at age 14. Bowles left the British service in Pensacola in 1779 under shady circumstances and was subsequently adopted by some Creek Indians of Muskogee. He ultimately married a minor chief's daughter and also a Cherokee woman. He fathered children with both of them. However, Bowles evacuated with the British Army to New York in 1781, returned to Muskogee briefly, but then went to Nassau, Bahamas in 1785, where he supported himself as an actor, a comedian, a musician, a painter, and a chemist, despite having no training in any of these fields, besides having a reputation as a warrior. By the way, his uncle was Carrington Bowles of London, who was famous for his period flag charts and maps, for example, his 1783 Naval Flags of the World. Bowles had many different names over the years, but his primary name was Estejoka, given to him by the Creeks. He said it meant great warrior, but others have interpreted it simply as the white man. Although much of his official history appears to have been exaggerated, or fabricated, he appears to have served as a possibly unofficial ambassador of the United Nations of the Creeks and the Cherokees to the Court of London in 1789-1790. He further claimed a general's commission in his majesty's service, but this is unconfirmed. He styled himself as the director of affairs of the Creek Nation, 1791 to 1792, but earned the enmity of the Spanish and so was a prisoner of Spain from 1792 to 1798, during which time he was transferred from New Orleans to Havana, to Madrid, to Manila, and back to Spain. But before arriving there, he managed to escape off North Africa and find his way back to Muskogee via England. He then styled himself the Director General of Muskogee, 1799 to 1803, at which point he was again made a prisoner of Spain from 1803 until his death in Cuba in 1805. So where the heck is Muskogee? The traditional homelands of the so-called five civilized tribes, the Cherokee, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Creek, and the Seminole tribes, was the territory roughly bordered north by the Ohio River, west by the Mississippi River, south by the Gulf of Mexico, east by the Appalachian Mountains into Georgia, and then along the Atlantic coast to northern Florida. By the 1790s, Europeans had colonized the Gulf and Atlantic coasts, confining the tribes to the interior. Maps at this time noted the largest part of the territory was the Creek country of the Muscogee Nation. Spain was nominally in control of West and East Florida, while the U.S. states of Georgia and South Carolina were in control of the Atlantic coast. In reality, while Bowles claimed the entire traditional homeland territory as his state of Muscogee, the actual land he controlled was centered on Appalachia Bay between the Ap Appalachia, Ap I, I have a hard time with these names, Appalachicola and the San Pedro or Ecofina rivers up to the Akinfinogi or Okefenokee Swamp, a very small territory. The supposed flag of Muskogee is found on the web in many places. It always depicted as a red ensign with a blue cross overall, fimbriated white, and a blue canton bearing a yellow sun with a human face placed at the hoist side of the canton. Where references for this flag are given, they are either 1962 Florida Historical Quarterly article entitled William Augustus Bowles in the State of Muskogee by Lyle N. McAllister, or the 1967 book, William Augustus Bowles, Director General of the Creek Nation, by J. Leach Wright, Jr. McAllister says the national flag of Muskogee was designed in 1800 by William Augustus Bowles. The flag, rectangular in shape, 
was divided into four quarters by cross vertical and horizontal blue, broad blue bars bordered by thinner wind, white stripes. The upper left and the lower right, left and right quarters were red. The upper right quarter was blue and had in its center a sun to which was added human features. This was credited to a letter dated March 21, 1954 from Lawrence Kinade, Professor Emeritus, Professor of History Emeritus, University of California, Berkeley. This design is different than that found on the web, specifically that the upper fly corner rather than the traditional Canton bore the sun on blue. Note also the description says the flag was divided into four quarters by cross vertical and horizontal blue bars bordered by thinner white stripes, which could mean a very different design than a fimbriated cross. Is Vexy chauvinism at play? Wright says, Bowles procured the flag in Nassau, the Bahamas in 1791 or in London in 1790, <clears throat> excuse me. He specified a blue cross be superimposed on a red background. The blue background of the upper left corner had a sun with human features resembling both an American Indian and Bowles himself. A footnote says a variation was a rectangle divided in the middle with a diagonal cross in the center of one side and a sun with human features in the center of the other. He credits McAllister for the former and the Spanish state archives as a source for the latter. Wait a minute. Now we have two different flags. The first is similar to what McAllister described and it is credited to McAllister but there is no mention of the fimbriation and the canton is back where we would expect it. The second design is radically different. Although he gives no colors, I imagined it using the colors of the first flag. Although this turned out to be very wrong. Is it real or is it Vexy chauvinism? The first design appears to have a number of traits similar to different British and Spanish European flags. A fimbriated St. George type cross design in red, white, and blue with a canton that adds the Spanish gold, hardly seems Native American, although as we have seen, William Augustus Bowles was hardly a Native American. To determine if the symbols on the first flag could really be Native American or European type symbols imposed on Native Americans, it is helpful to examine present day Creek symbol usage, starting with the current Muscogee Creek Nation symbols and folk usage. It is important to note that the Creek Nation, like the other civilized tribes, were forcibly removed from their original homelands in the 1830s over the Trail of Tears to present-day Oklahoma, where their tribal governments now reside. An example of Creek embroidery shows several crosses outlined in blue on a red ground, as well as other cross-like designs. Creek pottery sometimes has a cross motif surrounded by rays suggesting a sun design. The seal of the Muscogee Creek Nation Election Office has a cross-like design in the center, as does the seal of the Muscogee Natural Resource Conservation District. It is also helpful to look at present-day Muscogee and Creek tribal flags. The flag of the Muscogee Nation of Florida bears a cross-like emblem in its center made of two interlocking ovals, which could be similar to McAllister's description. The flag of the Key Kealegi tribal town in Oklahoma bears a cross and saltire like arrangement of artifacts. The flag of the Port Porch Creek Indians of Alabama has a fimbriated cross. The flag of the Natchez Nation in Oklahoma bears the same cross like symbol as the Muscogee Nation of Florida. An email from the Natchez Nation states the flag design was drawn and used over several thousand years by our relatives, the Mississippian. Natchez and Hopewell, Adenda, Adena ages. We use it because we are the Natchez. It is a symbol for the four winds, four symbols of life, four mother nation, our form of government, four kinds or colors of humankind, and several other things. It was adopted by our council about 2010. <clears throat> the Mississippian or mound builder culture flourished in the Mississippi River Valley from about 100 BC to 1700 AD. Known historic artifacts from this culture include gorgets, medallions worn from, worn from a necklace, many of which include both a sun and a cross symbol. The culture included sunrise ceremonies designed to welcome the rising sun 
and honor the four directions, the four winds, the four cycles, etc. The Natchez people were the last to leave their ancestral home and migrate south along the Mississippi River in 1700. My research was ongoing. Mostly by accident, I came across a PDF copy of the spring-summer 1983 issue of Tampa Bay History, which included an article entitled Spanish Interest in Tampa Bay During the 18th Century by Jack D. L. Holmes, which included a black and white illustration of the flag used by Bowles privateers. It was credited to the Mississippi Department of Archives and History at Paxson. Cur copy courtesy of Mrs. Yuli Lazarus, and it is inscribed, and you will pardon my mispronunciation of Spanish, Bandera que dicen usar los caserios de bowls. <clears throat> this design matches the description given by Wright in his footnote of what is contained in the Spanish archives, although somewhat different than what I had imagined. The Mississippi Department of Archives and History at Paxson provided images of their holdings, and it appears Mrs. Lazarus hand copied the design. MDAH also had another image, however. <clears throat> it was time to try the Spanish archives. The government of Spain main maintains several different archives online and one has to predetermine which will have the materials being sought. After considering the choices, I decided the Archive of the Indies had to be the correct site. Although it is broken down into subsections, for example, Cuba or New Orleans, fortunately the search function covers all of them. So I used the inscription from the MDAH image, Bandera Q Dicen Usar Los Coserios de Bowles, as a search query, and got no results. So I shortened it to Bandera de los Caserios de Bowles, which returned uh, Diseño de la Bandera de los Caserios de Bowles. And it was five results. There were <clears throat> the two flags. There were two sets of the two flags in the Spanish archives. One set dated 1802, which appeared to be the originals of the copies held by MDAH and another set um, attached to a letter dated 15 August, 1802. The, the uh, one set may have been part of a circular letter to inform Spanish naval authorities of Bowles' nautical identities. The set, set dated 1802 is included with a letter from Don Benito Perez, governor of Yucatan, to Don Pedro Sabales, the Minister of State in Spain, stating that he arranged a maritime expedition to attack pirates who were infesting the Mexican coast. The second set, like I said, are not attached to any letter. So, <clears throat> this is a close-up of the flags. And you can see that second flag has an interesting symbol on it that is actually not a cross. It's, um, it appears to be two crossed items tapered on one end with some detail on the fat end. And I believe we have already seen this emblem on two different present day Creek flags, that of the Kialigi tribal town of Oklahoma and the Muscogee Creek nation of Florida. They could possibly be crossed with native ball sticks. Wikipedia says traditional stick ball games were sometimes major events that could last several days as many as 100 to 1,000 men from opposing villages or tribes would participate. The games were played in open plains located between the two villages, and the goals could range from 500 yards, or 460 meters, to several miles apart. Rules for these games were decided on the day before. Generally, there was no out-of-bounds, and the ball could not be touched with the hands. The game began with the ball being tossed into the air and the two sides rushing to catch it. Because of a large number of players involved, these games generally tended to involve a huge mob of players swarming the ball and slowly moving across the field. Passing the ball was thought of as a trick, and it was seen as cowardly to dodge an opponent. The historical game played a huge role in the peace kept between tribes who played it. The game was not only used as a way to settle disputes and grievances among the many tribes, 
but was also played to toughen young warriors for combat, for recreation, as part of festivals, and for the bets involved. Often before the game was even played, terms would be set and agreed upon, and the losing team would have no choice but to accept the outcome. If a tribe did not accept the terms of the game, the dispute would often end in battle. This is a painting by George Catlin, done in 1846 to 1850, entitled Ball Play of the Choctaw, Ball Up. Shows the game in action. The game is still played today among the five tribes, especially the Creeks. So, why two flags? Well, the simple answer could be, ships have two flags, an ensign and a jack. Or maybe... These are the flags of two different nations. The United Nations of the Creeks and the Cherokees, or the Creek Nation, 1791 to 1792, and the state of Muskogee, 1799 to 1803. Or maybe these are two different interpretations of the same flag design. A clue, perhaps. A letter uh, intercepted by the Spanish, which was the fifth item from the Archives of the Indies, um, it was forwarded to Madrid in November of 1799 and was likely written by Augustus Bowles himself. And it concludes with the sentence, I finally cut off all com commerce with the Spaniards in which situation they still remain, although they know I am at liberty and on my way home. And the signature is the drawing of a flag. It was likely written in the fall of 1798 when Bowles was returning to Muskogee after being a Spanish prisoner for six years. This research is not finished. It is undetermined if these are an ensign and jack or two different flags of two distinct nations or two different interpretations of the same description. Who knows? Bowles 1798 flag signature seems to indicate the early and more important design. Spanish drawings may be inaccurate Spanish interpretations of the flags. Except for the 1798 Bowles sketch, we have no design that was produced by the entities cited. Bowles 1798 signature could be interpreted as, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, Bowles 1798 flag signature could be read as having no fimbriation on the cross. So we just don't know. Research is ongoing. Thank you and keep in touch. And I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. I've been planning this for several years, but things just got in the way and made it impossible to travel. And uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Do we have any questions from anyone in the audience? Vern, why don't you come up? Unfortunately, this is the only uh, uh, microphone, so you can talk to Dave. This will be my question. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Uh, how did how did you know the, the, the determinations of the Muscovy Nation that we actually covered, like that was in the Apological Revision? Okay. Uh, Dave, in case you couldn't hear, uh, Vern's asking, how did you find out the extent of the, uh, the, the nations that, uh, that you showed during your presentation, the, the geographic uh, depictions? Well, the, the, I showed you three different maps. The first two are actual uh, so, maps that I found online. Dave, um, Dave I'm sorry. Oh, real quick, since we're running out of time, I, okay. I, apparently I misstated Vern's question. Let me, let me get it back from him. He had a very specific region that Bowles would have considered. Oh, he's saying you had a depiction of a very specific region that Bowles considered. Okay. So, so that map is uh, available online, and it is a fabrication um, uh, by some people who were trying to estimate the territory actually controlled rather than what he claimed, and I think it's reasonably accurate. Okay. Steve. Uh, have the Creeks adopted Christianity? Thank you, Peter. Uh, Steve is asking Dave if uh, the nation had adopted Christianity at that point. Uh, when the, when the I don't believe the nation adopted much of anything. Um, William Augustus Bowles was uh, born a Christian, but he uh, lived as a Native American and participated 
in the culture and customs of the Creeks and, the, and their allies. Okay. Yes, Ted. Quick comment. I want to compliment Dave at being crowned by Lady Liberty. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, Amber, That's any questions? deliberate. <laughs> okay, uh, Dave, thank you very much. I'm going to do a switch on the computer here and, and uh, take you off the screen. Thank and, you all for having me. I wish I could be here in person. Um, it's great, it's great to, to know that this is still going on. I, I joined this organization in 1967, and it, I'm really glad to see uh, it is moving forward and everybody's doing a good job. Thank you very much. Dave, my apologies. Uh, I'm going to reintroduce the president uh, of our association, Peter Ansoff, who would like to uh, talk to you about something. Hello again, Dave. <laughs> um, we have a piece of business that we were going to transact at our, our, um, our banquet tonight. But unfortunately, since you're not here, we can't uh, do that. So uh, I thought we'd take care of it now. Uh, as you know, uh, NAVA's bylaws have a provision for uh, honorary lifetime membership in the organization for those who, who especially uh, deserve it. And uh, it's the unanimous opinion of the board of directors that uh, Dave is one of those people. So I would like to read the, uh, the citation that uh, accompanies that, which Dave will get, we'll get the, uh, the document to you as soon as we can. Award of Lifetime Honorary Membership to David B. Martucci. On behalf of the Executive Board and the members of the North American Vexillological Association, and in accordance with the Association bylaws, it is my pleasure to name David B. Martucci as a Lifetime Honorary Member for his distinguished service to the Association and to Vexillology. Mr. Martucci has been a mainstay of NAVA for more than 50 years, has played a major role in its success. His contributions include design of the NAVA seal in 1969, service as president in 1998 through 2004, NAVA news editor in 1998 through 2005, and service on numerous committees. During his editorship of NAVA news, he converted that publication from a short black and white newsletter to a high quality, full color magazine, which laid the foundation for today's vexillum. Mr. Martucci is a prolific and well-respected scholar, having authored numerous articles in NAVA News, Vexillum, and Raven, and has made many annual meeting presentations. In addition, he has done layout and created artwork for several NAVA publications, and organized and supported NAVA meetings, including NAVA 27 in Portland, Maine in 1993. Mr. Martucci's steadfast support for collegial scholarship, the depth of his knowledge of exilology, and his dedication to NAVA as an institution will set examples for NAVA members to come. Signed, Peter Ansoff, President, North American Vexillological Association, 18 June 2022. Congratulations, Dave. You deserve it. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Uh, I'm humbled. <laughs>